In my video on A Bittersweet Life, I made a case for reading the film's ending events as a dream. That movie's book-ending monologues about imagination and drive, the somewhat wry tone of the ending sequences, and the conflict and consequences that the protagonist fields throughout the film influenced this interpretation, which everyone unanimously agreed on. Look, I will never make a video or a film that I don't look back on with regrets, or things I will do differently. I was a filmmaker long before I was any kind of critic, and I don't really see myself as a critic. I will readily admit that my enthusiasm for editing these together in an entertaining way, and for what you can read from the actual frame, supersedes basically anything else. Interesting facts I can readily recall to mind that support or enhance my arguments and diving into what I can personally interpret with regards to the story's themes will always come at the cost of me having no patience whatsoever to leaf through scholarly papers or, in the case of A Bittersweet Life, listen to a South Korean audio commentary track where Kim Ji-woon, a director I greatly respect, basically said, nah, this is not a dream. No way. We got you. Not a chance. I return to that video because it raises an interesting quandary that applies to all films. Intentions. More specifically, the director's intentions. Where the director is concerned, intentions matter both a great deal and not at all. But don't even take my word for it. In today's world, as, well, all of us really, but, but as filmmakers and creators, you can't hide behind authorial intent. You can't say, well, this is what I intended, whatever you understood it to be. We live in a world where the person receiving the story has, has the right to say what it means to them. And I, for one, love that because it means the work should speak for itself. While Kim Ji-woon didn't intend for the film's ending to be read as a dream, he admitted it's not an uncommon interpretation, with some cast members of the film even reading the events as such. Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott have completely opposed readings of Blade Runner's story and ending, and the fandom is pretty divided on it too. All this despite Ridley Scott definitively laying out his intentions, and even working out another couple of cuts of the movie to better convey them. Even if you're vocal about your intentions, critics and audiences alike will ascribe different meaning to your work and different intentions to you. The scathing satires of Mary Heron's American Psycho, Paul Verhoeven's Starship Troopers, and David Fincher's Fight Club have been overlooked by scores of their fans for years, though that's not necessarily the fault of the films themselves. Tommy Wiseau thought he was making a masterful, emotionally charged riff on Rebel Without a Cause, and not one of the greatest comedies of our time. You gotta tear me apart, Lisa! Ryan Johnson is one of the biggest Star Wars fans around, something he's proven well before and well beyond his directorial efforts in the franchise. But he's spent years now pushing back against the idea that he hates Star Wars, and Star Wars fans, and Luke Skywalker, because of how certain segments of the audience interpreted The Last Jedi, and more specifically, taking things the villain of the movie said as the moral of the film. It's time to let old things die. Twelve seconds later. Ray, you must join me, Obi-Wan. Join me. I want you to join me. Shortly after Blade Runner 2049's release, Vice News put out an article deriding it as a misogynistic mess. Bad things certainly happen to the women in this film, but things that the film itself is staunchly against and disgusted by. This is a dystopian society, and Denis Villeneuve, who has long placed realistic and empathetically drawn female characters at the center of his films, sought to envision the horrible ways that our world today turns women into products to be consumed by men, and ties that into a narrative where many of the characters are questioning what it means to be human, and whether their station in life has robbed them of that humanity. Of course, that kind of nuanced reading doesn't boil down into a simple, anger-inducing headline that will drive clicks to your website, however. <laughs> On the reverse end of the spectrum, you've got Andrew Dominic, a guy who made Chopper, The Assassination of Jesse James, and Killing Them Softly. All great films, by the way. But then he said, you know what's next for me? A movie about Marilyn Monroe. Enter Blonde, which was hailed by the novel's writer as some kind of feminist masterpiece, and that Dominic himself positioned as a film about trauma and demythologizing a sex symbol. But in practice, well, it's one of the more stylistically impressive films I've seen in a long while, but the narrative and themes underpinning it feel so gross and poisonous that it doesn't matter. The film invents a lot of salacious details about Marilyn's life and ignores all of her successes to construct an extremely one-note carnival of cruelty. Marilyn is reduced to a wanting mother with daddy issues, and the predictable punchline to virtually every scene is gratuitous abuse and humiliation, to the extent it becomes predictable. There's a scene where she's topless and beaten by a man while bashfully saying, Daddy, why? There are scenes preceding and following abortions Marilyn's own gynecologist called bullshit on, where the fetus talks to her like some sort of alternate reality pro-life ad. 
Despite a typically committed performance from Anna Darmas, who is far better than the material deserves, it became clearer and clearer, regardless of Dominic's intentions, that he had nothing but scorn for Marilyn as a figure, and interviews he subsequently gave didn't play that down much. If you think that you can hide what your interests are, what your fascinations are, if you think you can hide that in your work as a as a film director, you're nuts. This leads us to another interesting wrinkle. What happens when a director's intentions are mysterious to the director themselves? Your father was a computer scientist. Your mother was a musician. When the spaceship lands, how do they communicate? That's they... a very good question. I like that. <laughs> You've answered the question. They make music on their computers and they are able to speak to each other. And you see, I'd love to say, you know, I intended that and I realized that was my mother and father, but not until this moment. <laughs> Filmmaking is a very intuitive process, and I think that the best films come from personal, intuitive places. Individuals with deep emotions and a clear vision committing all of that to celluloid rather than a committee crunching numbers and laying out a formula to decide how best to please everyone. Studio executives have also taken note of all this. They've seen how, regardless of a director's best intentions, audiences and critics alike will read their movies as discourteously as possible, or at least in a way that wasn't intentional. I think we've seen that fear really infiltrate studio films that explore big issues, with a greater and greater drive for the filmmakers and the teams behind these movies to spell out, in no uncertain terms, where they stand ideologically. Wolf of Wall Street, for example, I only learned the other day from uh, an interviewer who said, you're not aware of the war of Wolf of Wall Street? So I said, what are you talking about? So well, there was a big screening at Paramount, the picture, and the, for the critics in New York, apparently, I was told this, there were two camps. One camp that loved the picture and the other camp that was furious, saying I didn't take a moral stand on Jordan Belfort. Mm -hmm. And one of the critics from the other group that liked the picture said, do you really need Martin Scorsese to tell you that that's wrong? Right. Yeah, that's well said. That's well said. <laughs> Good cinema is not something that could have just as well been a social media post or an op-ed. Good cinema has layers and ambiguity. It invites the audience to read into characters and their behavior and the events of the story in different ways. Good cinema gives the audience more credit, really, rather than trying to foolproof itself against, well, an idiot in a hurry or someone out to make money off of anger and knee-jerk reactions. So, do intentions matter? Let's bring this ramble full circle. If I could go back and do my A Bittersweet Life video again, I would at least include Kim Ji-Woon's stated intentions. They're important to have on the record. But, and I want studio executives in the big leagues to figure this out, the beauty of art is in its subjectivity, and that is impenetrable. You can't prevent readings and interpretations that aren't in line with you or your team's intentions. Now, am I in the same league as the directors I've discussed today? Not even fucking close, but now that my films are playing festivals sometimes and getting reviewed, this is something I agonize over constantly. I've spent the nights before Q&A sessions anxiously wondering if I'll be interpreted in the worst possible way, or if a certain scene won't land right. And usually, of course, anything that comes out of left field was never even close to the thing I worried it might be, which includes these videos as well. <laughs> And then you've got OGs like David Lynch, who, when they're asked about their intentions, just say, uh, why, why, we'll elaborate on that. No, I won't. <laughs> um... Because to paraphrase the great Martin Scorsese, if it could have been explained in words, there would have been no need to make the film. And losing some of your audience along the way is a natural, inevitable thing. It's the price of a consistent vision and of artistic integrity.